the October. It's October, you spooky people. Yes. It's the month of possessions, the demons. <laughs> <laughs> I like you. You were. You're, whoa! <laughs> Are it's my season. Sabrina getting possessed. It was funny when you were saying what what you were just saying. I can't even remember the words anymore because I'm just excited. But you were like coasting right in between your demon possession voice and yeah. your normal voice. Mm-hmm. And I imagine that's actually what would come out of you if you were exercised ever. You know, if you had to be. <laughs> the best thing do. about it is that if I were possessed right now, you would never know because. The demon that would possess me is that good that you just don't know. Yeah. You have the top notch, like top tier. Oh, sorry. I got distracted. I'm like, squirrel, you're wearing your ghost sweatshirt. I wish I was wearing mine. I was Should wearing I a different sweatshirt. On? Wait, yeah, go run, change. No, wear it okay. for the next one. Okay, <laughs> be right back. <laughs> okay. do, do, do. Crane comes back, possessed. That'd be fun. What would an episode of Two Girls, One Ghost be like if we were just fully possessed for the whole time? I'm not saying that I want to do that, but would make for interesting uh, content. Don't tell Corinne I said that. This is me just talking to myself. I'm going to drink my coffee now. Keep myself busy. Keep my demons I'm, occupied. I'm entrapped. I'm tangled. Okay. Ooh. Yours is blue? Yeah. Okay. I'm back. I just talked to myself for a little while. So. Ooh. How did that good. go? Um, you might not want to know what I said. Oh, okay. <laughs> I basically was Being like, possessed. what if we just like had an episode where we both got possessed? Wouldn't that be really? And then I was like, I shouldn't say this, but it would be really good content. Yeah. No. <laughs> I mean, no. great content. But if we were possessed, then how would we have the wherewithal about us to even publish the episode? Unless that well, was the well, intention. The demons it was want, just like a the demons want possession. attention. They're, they're still going to make this happen. True. They That's want the world to see what they can do. And the two of us have in common. The desire to have attention. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think I have that in common with you. <laughs> <laughs> it's my Leo bleeding through. Uh, this is Two Girls, One Ghost. Two Girls. One ghost. And we are your ghostesses. That is Corinne. Hi. And I'm Sabrina. What if for the month of October we give ourselves demonic possession names? Like what would our names be if we were possessed? I'll be Katarina. I don't know. It's more like a that's very if I were vampire, a vampire diaries. I feel like that would be my yeah. name. Yeah. Right. That is the name of the lead in Vampire Diaries. That's probably why I'm thinking of it. Because mm-hmm. I did watch a lot of Vampire Diaries. So it's <laughs> for sure. That's where this is coming from. Yes. But it's like, you know, when you were taking like French class or Spanish class in middle school and high school and you had to choose a name to for go yourself. By. But it, yeah, like we had the rule where I think it had to start with the same letter as your own name. Mm. So I was always Carmen in Spanish Carmen. Class. Ooh, so now Carmen. Now I'm trying to think of like what would start with a C or with an S. My alter use. ego is Charlie. So I'll just go with that. I feel like. Charlie would be the name of your possessed little baby doll behind you as well. There Mama, help me. Oh. Mama, <laughs> I'm scared. Mama. Do you think when we have children, we're going to scar them? Yeah, for sure. Or do you think they'll sure. think this is fun? <laughs> oh, at first we'll scar them. They'll be working through that in therapy for years to come. But then they will also like have core islands of us doing scary things and like pulling pranks on other yes. people. And the amusement park island, the Halloween mm-hmm. decor island. Oh, the yeah. Haunted mansion island. Mm-hmm. All of the good memories. Wait, Believe it or okay. not, we're actually recording this a day before you've predicted that I will have a child on that day. September 21st True. is tomorrow. Are, My calendar just reminded right me. Now. You haven't had a child yet, but you no. know, perhaps you could conceive tomorrow. Or well, I did just have, have my period, year. so I'm not pregnant right now. Should we talk about the period app that I told you? About? <gasps> it's, it's so, so fun. cool. Yes, it's called okay. Stardust. You tell me, correct? Yes. 
Stardust. It is now on my homepage of my phone. It's so cute. It's so fun. Look at it. I mean, yeah, there we go. Sabrina's, for anyone watching on YouTube, she's showing her screen. But the Stardust app, it's a period tracker, and you can log your symptoms. Like, you can say, you know, what's coming out of you, what you're feeling, all that stuff, so that you Cramps, have it to back look back aids, on. farts, whatever it is. <laughs> all of the above. <laughs> Ooey gooey, rich and chewy, deep blood <laughs> clots, you know, like all of the above. What kind of niblets are coming out of you? Um, But I think what's really fun that you and I love about it is that based on your cycle, Mm -hmm. it tells you kind of like what you are in terms of aligning with the stars and with the moon. And it gives you a different type of profile and tells you a little bit about yourself. Yeah. Mine's not loading right now. Mine's not loading either. This is the worst (gasps) one. Okay. Well, we'll we'll post what we are on socials but yeah yeah, like you're a you bleed on the full moon don't you yes i'm a red moon witch is what it said and i was a purple things about yourself it's like what you're meant to do like how you're empowered if you're inquisitive if you're you know it it kind of goes more into detail about like who you are as a person based on that profile but like as the red moon witch it means that i i bleed on the full moon I bleed on the full moon. It's so bitchy. I love it. So if anyone wants to track my cycle, that's If what anyone it is. wants to bleed with us, sync up. I was Blood born sisters. on a full moon and I bleed on a full moon. Ugh. That's so cool. Right. I feel pretty cool about it. Wait. Sorry. It came back up. Start Stardust is working. Okay. Alrighty. Um, so first it says, I'm born under the full moon. Full moon babies are diplomatic, caring, and excellent at navigating polarities. Your purpose is to learn how to trust your intuition. And then my cycle type is red full witch. Period on waxing gibbous moon. Ovulation on waning crescent moon. As a red moon witch, you menstruate when the moon is full. It's easy to remember. When the moon is full, so are your underpants. With blood. (laughs) Red, red moon witches are historically linked to positions of wisdom and healing like medicine women, healers, and oracles. You ovulate with the new moon, which means you're most fertile in times of regeneration and uncharted territory. Your domain is that of love and battle. Wow. That's beautiful. I know. What's yours? Okay. I am a purple witch. Period on waning gibbous moon, ovulation on waxing crescent moon. Cool. As a purple moon witch, you get your period during the waning moon. When the moon is vanishing from the sky, your uterine lining is vanishing from your womb. (laughs) Purple moon witches are historically linked to life transitions of self-discovery and deep introspection. Your heightened intuition and psychic abilities are showing you where to put your energy. Your domain is that of freedom and ferocity. Rawr. I was born under the waxing gibbous moon. Waxing gibbous babies are introspective, flexible, and self-aware. Your purpose is to channel your dedication into a cause you believe in. Fun. I feel like that's that's a perfect – I really believe in this app now. Because I'm like, yeah. I feel like that perfectly describes you yes. and some of the desires you've Yes. I mean, going back to – you saying that you love attention. I'm like, let me go sit into a corner and face the wall and look internally into my brain and maybe go a little bit crazy because I spend so much time in there doubting myself. But no, self-respect, yeah. introspection. That's what I do. Someone on YouTube the other day said, the girl on the right, meaning you, you need to be kinder to yourself. You need to believe in yourself a little bit more. <laughs> yeah, I'm working on it. Therapy, my friends. I'm working yeah, on it. We all are. We I'm going to read when you go into like learn more in mm-hmm. a section about you on this app. I'm going to read a sentence that you read out loud to me the other day, Sabrina, that we both really liked. It said, by syncing your period to the seen and unseen cosmos, you're joining an ancient witchy history of people <gasps> who celebrate the moon's influence on terrestrial life. Yes. So we're just witchy people here. Witchy. We're all a little witchy. Mm-hmm. Um, speaking of. There's an email that I have been meaning to read to you for weeks. And I, I, I like in multiple episodes, I put read this email and I just forget. So I'm finally going to do it. I'm going to read this email Great. to you. It is the 
to me, best explanation of what our podcast ghost is. Oh, okay. Okay, so this is from um this is from our listener Danielle, and it's called I Have the Answer to Who Your Ghost Is. Okay. So lots of podcast episodes later and laughing at all the TGOG listeners, I've finally gotten the answer to who your podcast ghost is. And I mean, why not? But of course, all of the whispers and EVPs, the amount of paranormal listeners, the fact that it is the most popular podcast among ghosties. Time is relative. (laughs) What is time? Linear? Hell no. The ghost? It's you. And again, I mean, why not? It's taking manifestation to the next level. After your passing, you guys continued podcasting and you gained all these listeners who wanted in. They heard about campfire stories and felt a pang of jealousy. And that's when you realized, why not? Why not be the ghost in Two Girls, One Ghost? I mean, the ghost does things that you guys would do. All those our ghost would moments, it's because of course you would. Your ghost is like they're an old friend because they are. The idea that the podcast ghost is you guys in the afterlife in the afterlife has been a fun notion and I've ha- that I've had listening to the podcast for a little while. It's fun to think of it that way. And like the rest of the ghosts are your friends and podcast fans also in the afterlife boosting the podcast paranormal paranormality, paranormalness. I like paranormality. Feels legit. But anyway, <laughs> hope you guys found this idea kind of fun too. Keep on rocking. This is so fun. I literally got chill. I mean, these sweatshirts are fleece lined <laughs> and I got lined. chills halfway through that. What if we are the ones haunting yeah. our own podcast? It's very um, Haunting of Hill sense. House. We Little just came back. Little moment. Yeah. Right. It's like, what if, so you know, we've done this for so long? Did you, What was that? I whispered so interesting, but I was also like shifting oh. myself. So... It Sorry, sounded like it probably sounded very creepy, but it did. It sounded like the Alexa app or the device, and also you were looking away, so it didn't seem like okay. Anyway, oh. that it's it was you, uh, but it makes sense. Think about all the times that you and I are like, oh, I don't even remember what we talked about in that episode. Our ghost selves are going back to be a part of those episodes because time is a construct that we made up. It's all existing mm-hmm. all at once, and. We're just listening to ourselves tell the stories. And maybe we're like, wait, no, you guys, this is not the right information. And we're trying to correct it, but we can't. Or it's just, yeah, we know that if we push the book off the bookshelf right now, this is going to make for a great EVP. for. And also to take this a moment or a step further, what if it's not even just us? It's like everybody listens to yeah. the podcast, you know, the diehard yeah. phantoms. Like we are You're all, all welcome. the ghost. This is the pyramid scheme. Everyone is in it forever, for life. You right. sell, you sold your soul to us into this the podcast. This is so interesting. And maybe, okay, this is a really good theory. I'm really into this because <laughs> recently on TikTok, Sabrina, you had a viral TikTok and a lot of one. people were like, I can't believe one, it doesn't matter. It was excellent. <laughs> and we were like up all night watching the numbers and Chris, we were like, yeah, so exciting. <laughs> but Point being is a lot of the comments in there, because we were, we were it was a clip from one of our previous episodes about the demon presenting as a baby in a fire. In the fire. Sent in from yeah. Dylan. Um, but point being is a lot of people were commenting being like, whatever you speak out into the world will, will come for you. Basically telling us like, don't talk about demons so openly. Don't talk about these things so openly. Like, I mean, our whole podcast is that. So, and it's been five years. And this so whole I, month I'd is that. It, <laughs> Right. And I'd responded to a a few people being like, yeah, like we are pretty haunted, but like it's been five years and I I don't know, we're like generally safe. So what if because we're the ones haunting our own podcast, we're also simultaneously protecting the podcast from What if my guardian dark we are our own We are our own guardians. And that's why you don't know yours is because I can't show myself to me. And I'm invisible to you. You're invisible. And also you just said like you don't want a bunch of attention. You're just like fine no, you're right. being on the sidelines and only truly presenting yourself if you absolutely must. We can't cause a ripple in the, the time space continuum because physics. I think it's already happened. <laughs> I think we're riding that wave. We are poking the hole through we're that wrinkle in time. The wave. 
Here we are, baby. This time. Wow. Oh my gosh. This is so fun. I love this email. Thank you for reading it. Also, yeah, thank you for I sending send, it to us. I sent you a TikTok earlier. And you know what? I'm going to be a good person and I'm going to go in and tell you who the user name is because I never remember. Okay. It's called That Chicago Gay. And he mm-hmm. had in his house, when you were talking about Alexa, this is what reminded me of it. In his house, he realized that his Alexa went like bloop, 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 to listen and then started whispering these like unintentional intelligible things and he's like what the hell and so he went into his alexa app and he re-listened to whatever like the command was out in his room that made it chime and he had a white noise machine going on in the background and he, otherwise he didn't hear anything and he was alone yeah. but when he played it back on the alexa <gasps> app to hear what made it say like hello or whatever he heard alexa a whisper <gasps> And so people were saying because he had the white noise machine going, that is basically like a opening I mean, it it's up. Like a, one of the oh, like boxes of machines you can use for for spirits to come through and and speak. So a a ghost was attempting to whoa choose a song or something. Listen, maybe I, listen to our podcast. I don't know. Yeah, <laughs> Alexa, play two girls one ghost podcast. Please, ghost, do that. Um, I actually we have a listener story that I saved for a future episode all about a haunting that occurred with an Alexa. It is – and there's, like, recordings okay. and stuff. Oh, yeah, so hell we'll yes. look forward to that. I'm but super into this. Talking about putting it out there and being relatively safe, we are going to tempt fate this month. And um, all of our researched episodes are about demonic possessions, demons, and yep. that kind of stuff. And um, Leia's warning us. And before we're supposed to trust current, our pets, and yet we tread forward and ignore them for this month. Just, just we for are going to get really dark, you. really demonic. Uh, so I guess maybe like H's general trigger warning for the month of October is that because we're going to be talking about possessions and demons, sometimes we're going to say demons' names. Sometimes, yeah. and we'll give warnings before we do that. Uh, and then also, you know, with something like that, there's a lot of darker themes. That, that go with these cases oftentimes. You know, there's a lot of people that experience really difficult visions or things that they go through in their lives. Um, yeah. You know, the the line between demonic possession and mental illnesses and disorders is sometimes very thin as well. So we're yeah. going to do our best to handle the cases with care to give trigger warnings to people who are listening to so you can still enjoy the month of October and all of these stories, but not have to put yourself through you know, certain parts of these stories that can be a little d- too hard Triggering to listen to. Triggering hard to listen um, to, yeah. So we're yes. going to try. Yes. Okay. So because this is an episode where I guess this month is filled with demons, I decided to obviously do a demon and possession case. Mm-hmm. So this is a story of a psychiatrist who was called to help a woman possibly suffering from psychosis only to find out that she was suffering from something else entirely. This is the possession of Julia. So to note up top, this psychiatrist, Dr. Richard Gallagher, has spoken about this case, and he's written many articles himself about this case. And he received permission from Julia, the one that he helped and took on as a client, uh, to share this information, but not to share all of the details of of where it happened, the exact timing, any really personal information that would bring people back to her. So her real name isn't Julia, but that is the name that Dr. Richard Gallagher has used in his retellings and and articles and books and interviews and whatnot that he's done about this case. Yeah. So my sources for this episode are primarily articles written from Dr. Richard Gallagher himself, as no one else has come forward to speak of these experiences. Dr. Richard Gallagher was a psychiatrist. He graduated Princeton Magna Cum Laude. And so he was right by your where you grew up, Sabrina. Yeah, that was my old stomping grounds. As a high schooler, we'd run around the campus and pretend we were college students. It's so beautiful there. (laughs) Yeah, it is. So he graduated Magna Cum Laude from Princeton, and then he trained at both Yale and Columbia for psychiatry. 
His brother says that Richard has a photographic memory, which likely helped him during his Ivy League education. And Dr. Gallagher now teaches as a psychoanalyst at Columbia University and as a professor of psychiatry at New York Medical College. And he's highly respected in his field of psychiatry. Yeah, I was listening about his story and it's so fascinating. Like he truly never believed in any of this until he was reading articles in college and Are you going to talk about his brother's war experience? No, but you can right now. Okay. So I think this is a story and I obviously was just like listening to a couple of things while trying to like prepare for this episode, but he was at Princeton. He didn't believe in any of the paranormal or anything. He had read, um, I think about the Roland Doe case and like was intrigued Mm -hmm. by it and trying to understand like, where does it, you know, is it a psychological issue or is it paranormal? And he was, because he was studying psychology, he was, you know, leaning towards this is something more psychological. But his brother had found, I can't remember the reason for it, but had met this witch who had said that she was like a white witch living in Princeton or around Princeton area. And the brother was like skeptical as well. And was just like, I don't really believe in it. And she was like, I can help you get rid of that wart. And so she does some type of ritual to help get rid of it. But he wakes up the next morning and it was still there. And the brother kind of realized, like, I didn't really give her a chance. Like, if I didn't believe in it, how is her magic supposed to help? So he goes back to the switch and is like, I want you to do it again. And this time I'm going to, like, give you the benefit of the doubt that you actually do have abilities and powers. She does it again. The next morning he wakes up. It is completely gone. And he goes to meet his brother, Dr. Gallagher, and they, neither of them have an explanation for it. And so that was like his first introduction to like, oh, maybe there are some things that we can't explain right? in the logical sense. Well, and you know, it's interesting too, because so Dr. Gallagher, like he and his brother were raised in a very Irish Catholic family and Catholics believe in like heaven and hell and and obviously, like, the Catholic priests are oftentimes the ones that are doing exorcisms. But in terms of magic in the spirit world, there's a lot of resistance uh, and, yeah. and not a lot a lot of belief, I guess. I mean, I was raised Catholic, and it, it was very, like, black and white where, like, here's the parts of it that we believe in, and there's, like, a ton that we don't. Mm-hmm. And so it's interesting that they even kind of entertained when they were younger Yeah, this. Because yeah. they did grow up like very like, this is this is what we believe in, and right. here's what we don't. Yep. So, hmm. Also, wait. Side note. You said it was getting rid of a wart or a mole or something. A, a wart. Yeah. I read the other day that you're not supposed to pick up pennies on the street because it's often used from or like by by witches to as some sort of like conduit for getting rid of warts, and so. The, the person who was saying it didn't provide any extra oh. additional information. But in my mind, it meant if you pick up a penny and it had been used to remove a wart, you might get that wart. <laughs> oh, interesting. That's so, so fascinating. Food for thought. Okay. Well, pennies don't have much worth, so maybe don't pick no. them up anyway. <laughs> don't pick them up. Uh, okay. But Dr. Gallagher, he is also huge. He's six foot five, apparently. <laughs> he played – in Europe or, or somewhere like pro basketball for Whoa. a hot second. I don't know. This guy is like he's big and everyone who knows him says that um, he's just like just this no nonsense guy. The way that he speaks about any of his cases, whether it be mm-hmm. now the cases involving uh, possessions and demons or if it be just another patient that has a what we know is like a clinical diagnosis from the right. DSM. He speaks so dryly and so matter of fact, no matter what he's talking about. So there's mm-hmm. really no sensationalism or like added flair when he's talking about this. He possession. has a very clinical approach and he has that totally. deep. I've, I listened to um, a couple of hit, like recordings of him talking about certain cases and he just has that doctor voice. Mm. Like kind of deep well, and grovelly. I didn't grovelly. write much about any of the other cases. So at the end of this, you'll have to okay. add in any details okay. that you remember. He has a whole, I mean, he's a whole career of doing this. So there's a yeah. lot of different cases. Multiple books too yeah. for anyone who's interested in reading them. 
Okay, so the idea of demonic possession <laughs> never really crossed Dr. Gallagher's mind at all, or at least not in the sense that he believed in it necessarily. So he was always a skeptic, a man of science, and uh, as a psychiatrist, he felt that it was very important work to help diagnose people with mental, mental illnesses so mm -hmm. that they could receive the proper care. So to Dr. Gallagher, a possession case could simply be diagnosed as psychosis, a mental disorder, or some other mental disorders as well. To add some context into what was going on in the world when this case was happening, it happened in the late 1980s, which was the height of the satanic panic. Yeah. This was the time when in the U.S. and spread throughout the world, there was just this deep fear that people were committing these terribly abusive crimes in the context of the occult or satanic rituals. And so there's just a ton of conspiracy theories that that arose throughout America, especially, but all throughout the world. A lot of fear, too. So much. It was very, like, yeah. fear-mongering in the news, too. People were reporting these wild stories that never happened. Yeah. about It's kind of like the witch you know, hunt, again. It's just, like, the more modern-day version of it. Yeah. Absolutely. And basically, it was like, hey, these satanic cults are committing all of these horrible abuses. They're sacrificing people and animals and killing things. And if your children listen to rock and roll or play Dungeons yeah. and Dragons, like, they, too, are going to become evil they're evil and possessed with yeah Satan. you know yeah. like it was it was yeah devil worshipers were feared and totally believed like whatever their magic was or the people thought their magic was it was it was made to make people feel like they couldn't let their kids out of sight because their kids were not safe or their animals in the yard because the animals yeah. would be abducted and slaughtered in the under the full moon or like you know yeah that's what was going on yep uh this is important to have in mind <laughs> as context because that's what was happening when a catholic priest approached dr gallagher a psychiatrist or the psychiatrist that we're talking about and asked for his professional opinion on a case dr gallagher had seen many cases of psychosis dissociative identity disorder schizophrenia and similar disorders for before so he assumed that that was going to be the same for this case he was going to take on a new client likely was going to recognize that they were experiencing some sort of uh signs yeah. of mental disorder and then was going to treat them and help them yeah because so that's gallagher it, dr gallagher has said and i think this is common with exorcisms and possessions in general like while there are plenty of cases of exorcisms they're really hard to prove and a lot of the times they are often misdiagnosed or they are mental illness and misdiagnosed as exorcisms and like it does require all of this research and having a physician or a psychiatrist involved in an exorcism or in diagnosing a possession can only help the case right and i i mean i can't speak for all of the different varying sects of religion uh in terms of how they go about diagnosing someone as possessed or whatnot but i know for catholicism because we've talked about it before in different cases that we've covered that there usually is some sort of psychiatrist or mental yeah. health professional brought in because they try to debunk it as much as they yes. possibly can so and he's can i tell the first exorcism he did just real quick yeah so he was at princeton at the time in a an i can't remember who it is a, a priest of some sort basically knocked on his door and was like, I would like your help with an exorcism case, very similar to how this story starts. And Dr. Gallagher's like, I don't believe in any of that. And he's like, that is exactly why I'm asking for your help. Because I want someone who doesn't believe in it. I want someone who right. has the psychiatric professional, you know, uh, knowledge to come look at this case. And he goes and it's a, this couple who the husband kept waking up in the middle of the night to the wife being like physically attacked by an unseen force, like beat up. She was waking up with massive wounds and welts and bruises. And so at first he's like, this is clearly a case of abuse, like domestic abuse. And they're just right. trying to like cover it up in some way. He spends this, all this time with this family and this couple. And ultimately it's the first time he had to admit it was not 
anything he could explain. Like oh. it was 100% a possession. And it was, that was basically his start of him going to exorcisms and possession cases because he was like, I have to admit as a scientist, as a doctor, this is something I do not understand. And this is not a psychological disorder or anything that I can diagnose in the traditional sense. And he saw an exorcism happen and he saw it Which is, I can help. only imagine going through that as someone who both, like he had, he had his Catholic upbringing, like his strict Catholic upbringing. And then he had Ivy League science education. Like I can't mm -hmm. even imagine coming in as this psychiatrist who's gone through so much schooling about the scientific method and debunking things and what have you. And then witnessing that and being like, oh my God, what the fuck? How am I going to blend these two worlds together? Because clearly what I'm seeing yeah. is there's more than what I was taught. Which I kind of love. I almost prefer that journey because there's you and I, and there's probably most of our listeners who are just like hardcore, believe in everything. Honestly, red string conspiracy theories. We're here for yes. it. But and I love us. Don't get me wrong. I'm like all for <laughs> I us. I love us. I love us. But I do love hearing these stories of people who have just really resoundly denied the existence of something, but have the knowledge of science and everything they're studying to back it up. Mm -hmm. And then their reality is shifted. And they're willing to allow that reality to shift rather than right. be like, you know, no, it doesn't exist. I'm going to stick to my guns. Like being like, oh, I'm acknowledging there is something that I don't understand. And this is not what I was traditionally taught, but I'm willing to adjust my opinion because I'm witnessing it. Which is good to lean into it because also what would happen if you just blatantly ignored things? I feel like yeah, yeah. there's the crack in your foundation and yeah. you can't ignore that crack and it's just going to be there and get bigger and, and bigger. you're not going to be prepared for whatever happens yeah. when suddenly you snap and or like the whole world around you or you get goes possessed. past where yeah there's there's a lot but yeah he's an interesting guy and i'm i'm glad that he uh went this direction because now we get to Me tell too. The stories so fascinating so he uh basically had been helping out like similar to what you were saying sabrina with the first priest that came to his door he continued to help out the catholic church and many 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 people overwhelming majority of people that he experienced uh were mentally ill and he helped yeah. diagnose them mm -hmm. so a very small percentage of them were actually possessed and so when a priest who at the time was the most experienced exorcist in the country told dr gallagher that there was this woman who was suffering and he needed his professional opinion Again, Dr. Gallagher was like, oh, okay, I, pro I can probably put money on the direction that yeah. this is going in. So, oh, and by the way, I just want to say that at the time of the satanic panic in the 80s, there were only, I think it was like 10 at the time, exorcists in the United States. Wow. So there Ten. were so few people who were practicing. And now the count is over 100, which still feels like a very small percentage. Yeah. Of people. But at the same time, that's a, there's only 10 people. Right. And they're basically all going to Dr. Gallagher. Yeah. I, I mean, remember this is – we uh, the last demonic episode we did, we talked about how there was like a plea, a cry for more priests to become mm -hmm. trained in exorcisms because there was a rise of possessions. Yes. And I mean, yeah, it's a little scary to think about. It is scary. The rise in possessions. But yeah, it does make me wonder like what from the satanic panic that was 40 years ago at this point. Yeah. How much has that bled into our modern day and the, the need yeah. for extra exorcisms and exorcists? Okay. Well, Dr. Gallagher, he's approached by this priest and he kind of hesitates. He insinuates to the priest that in his opinion, this is probably not needed because the majority of the cases uh, are are just undiagnosed mental illness. He basically says, like, this is just going to be a bunch of hocus pocus. Like, I think this girl, this woman is just, like, dragging you through the ringer. They're, she's making stuff up. She's, like, putting on a show from what I'm hearing mm -hmm. from you. So the woman in question was named Julia, or that's her pseudonym for this story and the pseudonym that Dr. Gallagher has given her. 
She was a middle-aged woman with jet black hair who wore dark clothing and black eyeshadow. Julia was a part of a satanic cult and had made a very comfortable home for an entity to possess, and one gladly took her as host. So conflicted with her choice, Julia approached a local priest who then referred her to this other priest, the one that was the top exorcist in America at the time, uh, and then that priest is the one that brought her to Dr. Gallagher. Right. So she had been evaluated by two other psychiatrists already who were unable to di diagnose her with any mental disorders. Wow. But this new priest still wanted to do his due diligence, uh, and so he brought her to Dr. Gallagher, and Dr. Gallagher agreed to meet her and take her on as a patient. You know, he had a relationship with this priest already, so even though he's kind of pushing back, being like, do we really need to go through this? Like, it sounds, sounds like it's uh, definitely not a possession case. Right. He still took her on. Upon meeting, the first words that Julia spoke to Dr. Gallagher were, how'd you like those cats last night? <gasps> and this Eek. struck Dr. Gallagher as odd because the night before, he and his wife awoke in their house to their two cats that were like best of buds, always got along, just little snuggly bears together. They were screeching and scratching and attacking each other and just making such a commotion and getting really riled up and angry, like to a point where Dr. Gallagher and his wife had never seen the cats like this. Because yeah. They're like, what the hell are they reacting to and why are they attacking each other? So essentially, they took the cats, separated them for the night, and then the next morning, you know, the cats were, were fine, let, let out of their separated rooms, and Dr. Gallagher goes to work, and then this woman, Julia, is like, how'd you like those cats last night? So he's like, what the hell? This is so weird. So creepy but already. Off he the was bat. also so creepy. But, you know, he was also kind of like, all right, well, this could be, you know, like the typical uh, trick that people use that are fortune tellers where you say something like a little bit more general. Like if he was, you know, living in a city, what are the chances that a cat would make a noise at night? Like probably. Right. Probably relatively high. So kind of like throwing something out that's a little bit more general, but feels a little bit specific at the same time, trying to establish that connection. Uh and he was just like, you know what? It's just a parlor trick. Maybe it's just coincidence. I don't know. But then in his meeting, he found Julia to be very charismatic and engaging. She seemed like a pretty normal person to him. Ergo, her style choices were not really eating in her relationships at the time, <laughs> given that it was a satanic panic and she was totally dressing in goth clothing and makeup. So yeah. no fault to her own, but that's just the way that the world was at the time. We found that to be scary. She also claimed to be the queen of Satanism. So she had been a high priestess for a satanic cult that worshipped, and warning, I'm about to say the demon's name right now, Asmodeus, the prince or king of all demons and an entity that represented lust and indulgence. Mm. So Julia was, at the time, the high priestess for this cult. You know, like she met this group of people that she got along with really well. And also, I didn't write really anything about her backstory and upbringing but she as a child went through a lot and didn't have a lot of close relationships with friends and family and felt very much alone and then had met this group of people and this specific man who was leading this cult and basically found her home and, and so it was easy for her to get like sucked into these this cult further and further and deeper and deeper and deeper yeah because she didn't feel like she had many other options and she I did, enjoyed feeling like she belonged. Yeah, I did also read, and this is a trigger warning for sexual assault. Um, growing up, her family, she was not close with her family at all. And she kind of got involved in the church, which like, you know, you would think would be a great thing. And one of the priests took a liking to her and assaulted her, raped her. Yes. And mm -hmm. um it was like a very confusing thing for her and I think isolated her even further from her family, from her friends. And yep. then this priest did eventually get, I think, removed from the church, but who knows how many other people he did it to. But that being said, I think when she found this cult, yeah, like you said, she was super excited to have like a place where she felt like she belonged. Right. Totally. Yeah. So, I mean, she was basically – promoted within the cult yeah. to high priestess and then promoted again to queen of satanism she, she was like the top of the top at this cult the queen of satanism basically meant that she had to make a deal with the devil in the process 
And I'm not going to go into too many details, but I do want to give a trigger warning right now that for the next two minutes or so, I'm going to speak about things that involve child loss and pregnancy. Uh, oh, so this please skip so forward hard. if you are not in the position to hear this disturbing and graphic yeah. uh, detail that I am going to speak about right now. There were many sexual acts as part of this cult and their practices, and she was rewarded greatly by the cult for participating in these rituals. But also part of the deal with this demon was that she herself would become impregnated often and would sacrifice human fetuses, her own. And again, the cult praised her for making these sacrifices. So everything in her life was going really, really well from her perspective, despite all of these horrific things happening within the cult. Or so they said, uh, yeah. everything in her life was going really well. And she was given the power of telekinesis as a gift from this demon for her loyalty and for carrying out these atrocious acts. But once she got older and her reproductive abilities slowed down, she became less useful and the demon was less inclined or less happy to let her take up so much space in her own body and then started to basically use her as this host, this vessel for it to come forward more. Yeah. So Julia had felt like at this point it had gone too far and she didn't want to live with this demon inside of her, a demon who she began to fear. But she was also nervous that others from the cult would find out that she was seeking help to rid herself of this demon, which would be like just the worst thing ever for her yeah. to do. You know, like she was the head of this cult and she had a lot of other, well, she wasn't the head. There were other people too, but like she was in this really high up position. She was revered and and celebrated and was this symbol i guess within the cult and it would have put her in a very dangerous position so she thought to basically say that she didn't want to be fully involved in the way that she was and then and again keep like in mind saying, like it's a cult like group you, they isolate you from everyone else and everything else in your life yeah. so your resources are so limited that yeah she probably felt like there was nothing for her outside of this organization exactly well and then to your point too she also I, was very conflicted with what to do and who to go to because her relationship with the Catholic Church, given the assault that she experienced from a priest when she was younger. Yeah. It, 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 she just really didn't know what to do. But like, who do you go to? You, you know, yeah. at the time, that's who you're supposed to go to for yeah. possession. So it was really difficult choice for her to make. Yeah. So beliefs aside, Julia had a bit of a real life problem. Uh, and this is that aside from feeling like she was – possessed she basically knew she was because she would mm -hmm. experience these blackouts she said she felt as though she would go into this trance and during the trance like state her mind would just be entirely blank she wouldn't remember anything that she said or did during those times but people around her told her that other voices came out of her oh my gosh she also knew things that no ordinary person would know it was like the psychic ability but it was because she was possessed by a demon so it's like the cat she knew things what like the cats, knowing that Dr. Gallagher's oh, yes. cats were going crazy. Exactly. So she would share this information with Dr. Gallagher, information she knew about other people, information she knew about him, people that he worked with. And so he really was starting to be like, I don't like this. this is Maybe this is a possession case. I don't know. But he's still, you know, going through the process of having these clinical visits for potential treatment and diagnosis. But in one of the psychiatric sessions, Julia brought up that Dr. Gallagher's mother uh, had died of ovarian cancer. And for a minute, he was like, yeah, talking a little bit about it with her. And then he realized that he had never shared this information with Julia about his mother passing or about how she passed. And this was this was pre ask Jeeves. This was yeah. pre Google, you know, like you and he just apparently hadn't shared it. It wasn't like public knowledge it's not something you could look up no. and even like if she had asked certain people like they could have known that his mom died but he was like people didn't really know that she died of ovarian cancer like that was a very specific piece of information 1000 percent, and she would bring that stuff up a lot like she knew how people died she knew things about themselves that were deeply personal like their biggest regret their biggest fear their biggest secret that they've never told anyone and she would be able to regurgitate it back like things that people would do horrible things to ensure would never get out she knew leia's biting you leia's attacking me leia's possessed 
She's like, I told you at the top of the show not to talk about demons. <laughs> she was screaming and we didn't listen. Okay, so Julia's previous psychiatrist had also only met with Julia over the phone. So remember she had met with two psychiatrists before and didn't get a real diagnosis from that. And so Dr. Gallagher is the third person she met with. Well, the previous one before him had only met with her over the phone. And yet she knew specific details about his home. She would be able to talk about his decor, what color the walls the red were, curtains. what he was wearing. All of this. Yeah, the red curtains, all of this information. And so now Dr. Gallagher is even more like, holy shit, is this actually a case of possession? And his skeptical scientific mind couldn't really make sense of what he was witnessing with Julia because this was a really intense case for him. You know, like yeah. he had experienced some cases before, but this was just a culmination of so many details and abilities and one woman who otherwise was presenting as a, a very charismatic and, and cheery lady. So right. it was very confusing. Um, but anyway, so he's, he's starting to think, okay, I need to start making some plans maybe with this priest who brought her in. So he calls him and they start communing about making an exorcism plan and, and planning one. Julia and Dr. Gallagher had also been speaking in another session post Dr. Gallagher telling the priest, Hey, we need to, we need to, uh, start planning an exorcism. Mm -hmm. And she begins to tell him about this other priest. So not the priest that she met to go connect with Dr. Gallagher with, but another priest. And this other priest is actually someone who she hadn't, I don't believe, met before, but is someone oh. who Dr. Gallagher and the first priest were planning to bring in for the exorcism. <gasps> so he was a piece of Oh, my plan. gosh. And she's alone with Dr. Gallagher in the session, and she starts – talking about this priest and how he's walking along the ocean right now and that the wind is whipping against his blue windbreaker and his khaki pants and dr gallagher had chatted with this priest before in the planning phases and he's like i know that he's not at the beach right now like this is normally a time where i can i can catch him in the rectory like i can i can call him and he's always there so he's basically like, this is my opportunity to prove to her that she's actually experiencing a delusion. Like, I yeah. know that this is not the case. So he calls. This is real early days of cell phone. So I can only imagine what type of brick of a phone this priest <laughs> had in his pocket. But he calls the, the this priest, the one that uh, Julie is talking about, and asks him where he is. And the priest said that he felt an urge to take a walk. And so he went down to the beach. And... So then Dr. Gallagher is like, well, what color top are you wearing? Oh, and my Bruce gosh. Goes, a blue jacket, the blue oh windbreaker. Gosh. And he goes, okay, well, what color pants are you wearing? And the priest just starts laughing and said, oh, you must be talking to Julia. <gasps> so they knew, the uh. priest knew what she was capable of and what she could oh my gosh. possibly see and do, which is terrifying. Yeah. It's horrifying. So Dr. Gallagher, he continues meeting with Julia, hoping that, he will hopefully, you know, change his mind. It's all coincidence. It's all parlor tricks and magic tricks and none of it's real and it's not actually a possession case. But her powers, or should I say the demon's powers, uh, they pick up. In his office, as he's meeting with her, books will fly off the shelves in opposite direction while she's there. And a few months after meeting Julia, Dr. Gallagher officially deems her of sound mind and body and aids in scheduling an exorcism. So, like, she is... Possessed, officially you need to move possessed forward with the exorcism and also dr gallagher does not perform exorcisms and he doesn't actually diagnose anyone as possessed he just diagnosed them or he just essentially says that he cannot provide them any medical diagnosis that he's yeah. aware of which then basically triggers the priests or whoever is in charge of the exorcism to follow to yeah. to really start planning this ridding of the demon yeah. uh, practice. So he said, quote, Dr. Gallagher said, quote, this is not psychosis. It was what I can only describe as paranormal ability, end quote. And so the priest who had originally brought Julia to him would be conducting this alongside others, including that, that other priest from the... The beach, ocean walk. Yeah. The ocean walk. Julia... Dr. Gallagher and the priest are all driving together in the car one day. This is 
like a week or two before the exorcism. And they're discussing the upcoming exorcism plans. So Julia is like fully aware of this. Yeah. And then suddenly she goes into the trance-like state. She's no longer present. Something else comes forward. It is a guttural voice emerging from her that yells, leave her alone, you stupid fucking priest. She is ours. Oh, Julia remembers. Oh, I just got chills myself after saying that. So yeah. creepy. She's she remembers ours. none of it. She is ours, you stupid fucking Which like, ours also so implies multiple, multiple demons. Right. Yes, yes. Or even just like the darkness, you know, like as yeah. a blanket, all of yeah. the demons, which actually oh makes me gosh. wonder, like if someone's possessed, sometimes it's theorized that it's one demon or that there's, there's seven. That makes there's me multiple. wonder, does everybody have to enter all at once or is it kind of like a whoever's Come invited to the please. dinner party, you can invite them a few in for dessert after, you know? Ugh. So Julia doesn't remember any of this because she was in a trance. She was not present. And then a few days later, Dr. Gallagher and the priest are not including Julia anymore in the conversations, and they are talking over the phone to each other about the possession, and a third voice comes over the receiver. Now, it's just that priest and Dr. Gallagher on the phone, from what they know, but a third Mm -hmm. voice enters. It's the same demonic voice that had escaped Julia in the car, and it is telling them that Julia belongs to Satan and warns the priest to back off. So Dr. Gallagher and... The priest, they immediately like whip up where they are. Like the the priest is in his church and Dr. Gallagher's in his office at the time of this phone call. So they both pop up in their own respective places and walk through the office slash the church looking for Julia because they're like, she must have snuck in. She's got another receiver. Like she's, you know, messing with us. She's nowhere to be seen. In fact, they do locate her and she's thousands of miles away at the time. Ugh. On a similar drive from the time that Julia, the priest, and Dr. Gallagher had all been together, Julia is alone with the priest, and she again is pushed out by the demon. The voice is telling the priest to leave her alone, but this time, shadows fill the window shield. Whoa, the window shield. (laughs) Shadows fill the windshield until... He cannot see the road anymore. Oh and my he gosh. ends up driving into a ditch. So all of these dark shadows start I, whipping yes. in front of the car until it's utter blackness in front of him. It's like he's in this plume of dark. Yeah. This, this Which cloud. is so terrifying. I when I heard that part, I was like, it's so it's scary. like the underworld. Yeah, like what it's is what, what is picture. he summoning? What is this entity summoning? Is it like other souls? Is it other demons? What is it? Because it is absolutely horrifying and i'm just imagining them like slowly engulfing the car yeah just tons of them it it very much feels like the death eaters from harry potter that's Mm. also what i picture (sighs) as it swirls around and swoops yeah but they went off the road luckily they were fine and no one was injured but when the priest looked back at julia after they'd crashed he said she was looking at him smirking. So the demon had still been oh. with her. So it became very clear to all of them that one thing was true, and that was that Julia was very quickly becoming not in control. She was yeah. taking a second seat, the back seat to this demon in her own body. Oh, so scary. So she's in this constant battle to be present but is still present enough at the moment to beat out this demon and basically say like hey i'm gonna go through with this exorcism it's getting a lot stronger it's taking up more space so julia's kind of rushing with the priest and with dr gallagher i guess well dr gallagher isn't really necessarily part of this exorcism piece of it but does stay in contact with the priest and and here's what happens right. after. But everybody's kind of rushing towards the finish line of like, let's get this possession taken care of before she's no longer able to fully yeah. be present and make this decision. And the demon walks off and says, never mind, she's not getting exercised. And then they totally lose control over this right. situation. So the exorcism date was set and it would be conducted in a simple church with an altar and one crucifix set up for a pretty routine exorcism. 
But despite what we see on movies, exorcisms don't often result in tables flipping and people screaming in tongues. Exorcisms that have been taped usually show just some general discomfort from the person. Yeah. Well, I shouldn't say general discomfort. You know, there's like thrashing and whatnot. And right. it can be feel intense, but there, no one's crawling up backwards or having right. their heads go 180 and vomiting on the floor. Like, it's not really what what the Hollywood shows us. Yes. But it's still very mentally and physically draining on the people that are performing the exorcisms. It's still scary. So people are nervous. And are you would nervous. think that they're, they are draining on the victim of the possession as well. But. Oh, yes. Apparently, and everyone has superhuman strength. <laughs> yeah. But apparently, I mean, I from what I heard, Julia like was not losing steam or energy for like hours yeah well we are about to get into this Ugh. so everybody's a little nervous yeah a little of course. extra nervous because of what they've already been told from this priest they were like okay this demon that we're going to be exercising is more than our run-of-the-mill position possession yeah. which is kind of like an odd sentence to say that there is like kind of a norm or like oh no big deal right. it's just your average possession but like this one they knew was probably going to be a little bit worse given all of the signs and examples of this demon strength that have been right. exhibited in the past few weeks and months. So the group that is there to tackle this tough and nasty demon is a group of six people. The priest who brought Julia to Dr. Gallagher, the other priest from the Ocean Walk, two nuns, three men from the <gasps> congregation, and My one light just other turned woman. out. I'm shitting myself. <laughs> Sabrina, what are you gonna oh! do? I have a backup. Let me see. Go get that backup battery, and let's pray it doesn't also time out. Otherwise, I feel like we're enough to pivot for October. Cause what the fuck? <laughs> Ugh. The worst part is that it's happening to you and not me, and I'm the one that did the research. But somehow you're the one that's experiencing paranormal activity at the moment. Mm, let's just say it died. It's okay. Let's just say it died. Just a glitch. Just something yeah. weird with the wires. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, all right. <laughs> so the group has the priest, the other priest from the beach, two nuns, three men from the congregation, and one woman. And the group waited patiently and nervously together in that room for Julia to show up for her exorcism appointment. Eek! And then... Julia arrives, dressed again in her typical outfit, her dark flowing clothing and heavy grunge makeup. Julia breezed into the room and she said a quick greeting to everyone, seemed to be quite nice to everyone who was already there shaking in their boots, ready for her to come <laughs> in. But, you know, she made a pleasant entrance, a quick hello, hello, hello. Yeah. Uh, though herself, she was a little bit nervous. But again, this wasn't her first exorcism. This demon had been attempted to be removed from her before yeah julia made her way to the center of the room and sat on the chair that had been placed there for her the three women the two nuns and the other woman hover around her placing their hands on her shoulders and arms to brace for any sudden movements from the demon one of the nuns was also a trained nurse and was ready to step in should there be any medical emergency the three men from the congregation stood close by as well they were there as backup for a little extra muscle. There is a buzz about the air and the energy has most certainly shifted. But the group doesn't know if it's Julia's presence or their own anticipation of what could come. They begin the exorcism in the standard way, the priest reading Latin prayers from the Roman ritual. And then a voice erupts from uh. Julia. It is this raspy, this hissing, this loud cry that reverberated through the chapel. The demon was awake. Between Eek. its growls, it spoke in Latin and then in Spanish. Two voices were slipping out. One was guttural and one masculine. Or sorry, one was guttural and masculine. The other was high-pitched. These were languages that she didn't know. Julia did not speak Latin or Spanish. And also to your point, Sabrina, earlier when you were saying like we, like she's ours, it means more Multiples. than one. Yeah. And the fact that there are two voices in here, it does kind of seem like there might be 
two entities residing yeah. in it. Yeah. The demon or demons that are coming forward make Julia thrash around in her chair. They're fighting against the prayers and the two priests continue to recite these prayers over and over despite everything that's happening. The three women are still holding her down. The men from the congregation are now off the wall, inching much closer and closer and closer should the entity finally overpower the three women who had shifted now their entire body weight into keeping this woman, Julia, in the chair. Two hours pass. The demon has not given up. It hasn't told them its name or reason for possessing Julia. It is holding on to its host. And then, like a scene straight out of Stranger Things, oh, no. she's running up that hill. Julia lifts from her chair. <gasps> Actually, wait, I shouldn't say lift. She, that is not the right terminology. She floats at like a high speed. She's zooming out of her chair, floating into the space above the Stop. chair. So high and so fast that for a moment, everybody in the room actually thinks that she's about to break through the ceiling. Like they truly think Holy. the demon's going to try to drag her flesh and body, bone, bloody oh. being through the hardwood ceiling. Nope. So she flies out of this chair, being dragged by the demon. It's trying to escape, and the men leap forward. They reach as high as they can to try to grab Julia's dangling feet because this is a chapel. Like, Stop. These are high. This is. Like, <laughs> I'm. This is not. No, I'm not okay with it. Yes, this is very Vecna's curse. It feels like. Yes. But this was in the 80s. Oh my gosh. So her feet are dangling. She's now kicking. She's thrashing. And the men are trying to grasp for an ankle, hold on to whatever they can get their hands on. They're holding on to her legs, trying to pull her down, but all of their weight won't make her budge from floating in this position in the air. All of them. She weight. remains lifted high in the air for 30 minutes. Stop. Not two minutes. 30 minutes. No. A half an hour. No. No. Can you what imagine is going just through all there? of their minds? For 30 minutes as they're trying desperately to keep her oh my God. and pull her down. I just imagine minutes. that room must have smelled so bad because I'm just picturing <sighs> like all of the like nervous sweat and BO and probably I, I would assume someone would have peed themselves, right? I feel like Me. I would have. I'm I about that. to right now. Right? I just feel like it would be a real stinky room. Jeez. Okay. So one of the nuns now grabs some water and places a little swab of it on Julia. It's ordinary water. It's not blessed to test what the demon's reaction is going to be. It's already up in the air thrashing around. It's really scary. So they just want to see like what, what more could happen. No reaction to the ordinary water. So now reaching for the holy water, the priests begin anointing Julia. The demon then yells, leave her alone, you fucking priests. Stop, you whores. You'll be sorry. You should do that in your demon voice. Okay. You'll be sorry. You'll be sorry. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and I'm sure they felt very sorry after because... And terrified. It's absolutely horrifying. And so these angry words spoken by the demon turn to violent and agonizing screams as the holy water is being oh my put gosh. On, on them. And the priests are reciting these prayers and anointing this entity or entities. The many voices And of that's the probably so difficult to... I'm just imagining psychologically you're witnessing this woman, Julia, who, who you've seen as a competent human being screaming mm -hmm. and writhing in pain, but you, you have to like disconnect that pain from her and associate it with these entities that are harming her. But like you're hearing her voice, her screaming, right. her pain. Well, it's so scary too because it's like with all of this that's happening, I, I would assume the body has a response. And so it, yeah. it would be hard to witness someone also kind of like contorting in ways that you know are going to injure them or knowing that their heart rate and their blood pressure are going to spike to really, really dangerous levels. Like there's a lot of, I mean, uh, I think that's partially why they had one of the yeah. nurses there or one of the nuns that was also a trained nurse present in the room because it does a lot of harm to the person who's hosting that yeah. demon as well. Jeez. So now the voices that are all coming out of this entity encapsulate the entire chapel. It's not oh my God. coming just from Julia anymore. The voices oh. are everywhere. You'll be sorry. The You'll hissing, be sorry. The screaming. You'll be sorry. Yes. It's 
every corner the hissing the screaming the crying every Ooh. corner of the chapel oh there our is. editor should aiden can you guys make it sound so like it's coming from the right ear and then left ear you'll be sorry you'll be sorry you'll be yeah. sorry. sorry leave her alone she's ours <laughs> So the entity is no longer, I mean, it's still attached to Julia, but it's no longer just Julia. It is everywhere. And this actually, is I'm going to pause for a moment to ask a question of everyone and of you, okay. Serena. I feel like this is a question that doesn't get asked enough when it comes to you, exorcisms and possession cases. Okay. When the entity is being ripped out of someone else's body, what's to stop it from possessing anyone else in the room? And also, oh. has one ever possessed a priest? Well, isn't that the whole, um, that's the case of Arn Cheyenne Johnson. I think that's his name or art, something like that. We covered it a while back and he was at a possession or an exorcism and then became possessed. Uh, but there's got to be more care or, or some sort of steps taken, right? To protect yeah. everybody in the room. I don't know. Be especially if it's like. The way that this was is it splintered into a million different pieces, Ugh. basically. It was like part of her, but it was also in every inch of space in this chapel. And so it's like, how do you escape it? You don't see one point that you can run from. It's everywhere. Yeah, I don't know. And the thing that also scares me is like, like we've learned from Rick, the Rick episode, Dominus 12, it seemed like this demonic entity when it wasn't possessing Rick could possess other things. So it's like... Why is this demon so just holding on to Julia if it, if it's not mm -hmm. there all the time and it is able to possess other people at other t it just I just don't understand them and it's so confusing and there is no logic and or it's hard to right. think of it in logic sense because they are beyond the yes. rational realm of and I would just the world right I feel like they they could make it easier on themselves too right like Julia is clearly seeking help. She's going to different psychiatrists. She's going to different priests. Isn't there mm. an easier host? Someone who isn't going to do that? Someone who's an easier sitting yeah. duck? Like, yeah, maybe she was a great partner for a while, but now she's not. So, like, let her go and find someone else. Not to yeah, I don't make know. someone else possessed, but, like, I don't understand the the need to stay when there's clearly so much resistance happening. Yeah. It's like an obsession. They can't. They're addicted mm -hmm. to her body. Okay, so now, like I said, the voice is everywhere. The demon is spread out throughout the chapel. Its presence is felt. The temperature in this trap chapel drops to freezing and then swings up to unbearably hot. Then it's cold again. Then it's hot again. Then it's cold again. Then it's hot again. Like this demon is fighting. And then it stops. Everything stops. Everything returns to normal. The priest concludes the exorcism by saying, Amen believing to have successfully banished this oh, no. entity. Hours have gone by. This group is exhausted. Yeah. Julia. I'm exhausted. In the chair, right? It's, I can't even imagine hours of that. Like you have yeah. to be alert every single second yeah. of this. You can't space out. You can't take a moment to yourself. Like everybody's present fully. Julia, now seated in the chair, opens her eyes and looks up at the priest. Her face filled with concern. She still feels it. Oh, no. Unfortunately, oh, no. Julia never allowed another exorcism to happen, though she remained possessed, and she returned to the cult. Dr. Gallagher says, quote, exorcism is not some kind of magical incantation. Normally, a person has to make their own sincere spiritual efforts, too. So the thought is that because Julia was so torn between her religious group and getting rid of this possession... The demon had the upper hand here, and even though they gave all of their best efforts with this exorcism, it just was never going to work because she wasn't fully, wholeheartedly yeah. ready to banish this thing. She wasn't ready yeah. to be fully exorcised, oh, and geez. so it stayed. A year later, Dr. Gallagher spoke to Julia on the phone. She called him to let, her, to let him know that she had cancer. He offered to meet with her again and to move forward with another exorcism, but she said, well, I'll give it some thought. And that was that. He never she heard had, from I think her again. She had expressed like she wanted to be 
exercise of the possession before she died. Like she knew she was going to die, but I think the implications of what that meant of like going through the exorcism mm-hmm. again was probably just too much to bear. And she'd also go back to the cult. So, you know, like, yeah. again, the same sort of situation and complications arise when it comes to her relationships. And yeah, she wasn't uh, she was in the same position as she was before, whereas like the desire was there, but she had a lot of conflicting beliefs and desires as well that like, yeah, maybe she would have gone through with it and it wouldn't have resulted in anything different. Maybe she would have still been possessed. Right. So. After he spoke with her, he lost contact with her and never heard from her again. So he presumed that she did lose her battle with cancer and with this demon. Dr. Gallagher went on to professionally consult on hundreds of more possession cases, the large majority of them resulting in psychiatric diagnosis. Though there have been a few cases, like Julia's, where there are no conceivable medical cause and he can't ignore the superhuman strength the levitating, the telekinesis, and the (laughs) telepathy experienced by the few. He said one time there was, quote, one woman who was about 90 pounds soaking wet. She threw a Lutheran deacon who was about 200 pounds across the room. That's That's not psychiatry. That's beyond psychiatry. Jeez. Dr. Gallagher approaches each case with skepticism, and he never diagnoses possession, but rather informs the clergy that the symptoms in question have no conceivable medical cause. To conclude the story, I'll leave you with this quote from Dr. Richard Gallagher. He says, quote, it is, pos- is it possible to be a sophisticated psychiatrist and believe that evil spirits are, however seldom, assailing humans? Most of my scientific colleagues and friends say no because of their frequent contact with patients who are deluded about demons, their general skepticism of the supernatural, and their commitment to employ only standard peer-reviewed treatments that do not potentially mislead a definite risk or harm vulnerable patients. But careful observation of the evidence presented to me in my career has led me to believe that certain extremely uncommon cases can be explained in no other way. And that is the possession of Julia and the attempted treatment from Dr. Richard Gallagher. I would love to talk to Dr. Richard Gallagher. I feel like – and he does do interviews on podcasts, I'm I'm pretty sure. So um, maybe we could talk to him. Let's hit him up. Um, Let's hit him up. Um, I did hear also that during this Julia case – so she was trying to, as she was going through this exorcism, like – understand what her role was and how she could leave this satanic cult Mm -hmm. and the cult as as similar to the demon would not let go of her and refuse to let her leave as is something we've known and learned about cults like people don't leave that it's just not or if they do it's very difficult they try to blackmail you they try to hurt you right in any way they can it's fear-mongering it's blackmail whatever they can do well and there was one specific guy too that was sort of like the main guy that led this cult as yeah well. so it wasn't just this group of people who collectively were like we're gonna keep her but there was this one man who was very yeah. responsible for the brainwashing of the majority of right. people supposedly in this group yeah so apparently they also like and everyone who was involved in this diagnosing her as possessed and exercising this demon from julia were became victims of this cult, of this leader, who I guess Dr. Richard Gallagher's wife once got a phone call from, it sounded like a a police officer or, you know, some type of Mm -hmm. official uh, agent saying, um, your husband was in a terrible car accident and might die, basically. She's freaking out. She's calling all of these hospitals in the area trying to find where her husband is at. And like she can't reach anyone. No, there's no record of him anywhere. She thinks that he's died or dying. Right. And three hours later, gets a phone call from Richard when he's like at the like I think in New York, he's at an airport and is totally fine. And basically this cult was just trying to like mess with their lives. Right. And it's manipulating fear. everybody. Yeah. It, totally. And it's threatening. It's like, we have the power to hurt him. Yes. And I I would assume that certain people in certain groups, depending on what your child or your spouse or your brother or your friend has 
gone through in the past, like that would be yeah. an easy thing to be like, okay, I'm cutting you out of my life now because this is really scary and yeah. I don't want to experience this and I don't want to be closer to these people. And so it's one more thing that probably makes it easier for for other people to cut off those close to them, you know, yeah. like whether it be, I mean, for all we know, like maybe Dr. Gallagher, thank goodness he didn't, but like what if he did get sucked into the cults and he stopped speaking to his wife and all of his colleagues because he was trying to protect them from experiencing stuff like this. Like it's just yeah. so, cults are just so, there's, it's so complicated, right? It's so complicated. Each one is different and the the methods that they use, sometimes unpredictable, but in the end, it all goes back to psychology and manipulation of people. Yeah. And it's just really scary. It is. And this possession is terrifying. And it's so sad to, mm -hmm. to know that Julia died without any reprieve and that she wasn't able yeah. to rid herself of this entity and that, yeah, it's just, it's heartbreaking. And I'm just picturing her levitating for 30 minutes is, it's just, for people who don't believe in demons, it's, I, I don't know, I guess I'm of the belief, like, it's better to believe in things, even if you don't understand them. And this is just my personal opinion, because then I feel like you can learn about them and try to better prepare yourself to understand it. Or I guess maybe I'm, I'm afraid of demonic possessions. So by learning about them and hearing about them, I feel like less terrified i don't know it, i guess it's yeah. like the way that people are into true crime and serial killers it's i was just, just like gonna say the same thing wanting you, you to feel like as know. a woman especially i think the majority of true crime listeners end up yeah. being female and i think that part of that is because we, we some part of us is fascinated with learning what what could go wrong or yeah. what are the steps that could eventually save us should we be in that scenario. And the yeah. chance of being in that situation is so incredibly slim. It's like when I was younger, I was obsessed with reading all of the books, the worst case scenario survival guide mm -hmm. and under like memorizing them. Like what do, what do I do if a crocodile attacks me? What do I do if there's quicksand? And it's like I've never lived in and will probably never visit a place that has that. Yeah. It's like the need to know what to do. Yeah. I don't know. I don't see a problem with that. I'm with you. Sabrina. I don't either. Yeah. Also, I'd I rather have know it. and never have to use it than find myself surprised in a situation and have right. no clue what to do. Although I, yeah, I do feel very safe with this community we have at Two Girls One Ghost and with you, just because I feel like if I started acting a different way, you would instantly be be able to pick up on it, or other people would be able to pick on it, or or if something weird started happening while we're recording, like I feel like we have so many people behind us and supporting us to mm -hmm. help us through it, which, you know, I kind of feel, and I'm going to knock on wood when I say this, I feel like we have demon proofed ourselves because we have built this community that is so safe and protective and light and happy and supportive that like no demons There's can come in There's just a ton of here. good energy. Yeah. 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 I agree. Well, I mean... And maybe we're all protecting ourselves from the other side in the future, too. Yes. Okay. So. Well, to end this episode, I have a listener story um, from our listener, Julie. And two stories. One is sleep paralysis and one is about a possession. So I'm going to read both. But the possession okay. one reminds me a lot of the Julia story. Hi, Corinne, Sabrina, and Ghost. Longtime listener here, and I thought it was about time I send in a few stories. But the first thing is, and it's funny, is when I found out that people were listening to things called podcasts in probably late 2018 or early 2019, I searched for paranormal slash ghost podcasts because I wanted to find others that believed in the supernatural as much as I do. And I landed on TGOG. I'm so thankful I did. You two are really so great, and I hope to catch a live show one day. Okay. As some background, I grew up in a Christian household and considered myself religious until maybe my junior year in high school when I started to question things I didn't feel were adding up or aligned with what I believed. When I was young, my family relocated from the Midwest to the Southeast in the late 90s. 
we went from moderate Christians to born again and started going to churches that preached heavily on sin, damnation, and spiritual warfare. And no, it's not what you think. These weren't some of the back these weren't some back of the woods churches. One of them was a mega church while the other had a thousand plus members. This is important because although I don't consider myself a Christian anymore for various reasons, it has shaped the way I view evil spirits. And here are a couple of stories that have made me think, what the fuck just happened? (laughs) Sleep paralysis, end of high school. I had my second encounter with sleep paralysis back in high school about the time I started questioning my faith. In reality, I was pretty much done because I was tired of hearing that I and my other and my friends of other religions were going to hell. It wasn't uncommon for me to have nightmares, so I had a nightlight, and there was an outlet near the end of my bed, and the end of my bed faced my closet. Well, on this one night, I was sleeping, and the paralysis feeling came over me. I could sense a presence from behind, like they were standing behind me, and I woke up, but I wasn't awake. I could see my room, the light shining from my nightlight glowing by the end of my bed, and that knowing that I wasn't alone, but that there was something evil with me. Then, I felt it, by my neck. And in that moment, it whispered in my ear, Julie, let me help you. Ooh. It's hard to describe the voice. It was almost tempting and seductive, but also just not right. And I knew it was inhuman. From my fear, I turned to what I knew and felt a power to scream something on the lines of, go away in the name of the Lord. From that second, the presence jumped to the end of the bed and was captured in the light from the nightlight, and I saw the shadow creep down on the floor, and I woke up for real this time. I still felt the presence in the room, but it was fuzzy, so I screamed for my brother, and I want to say that I was crying and hyperventilating at this time, but if I wasn't, that emotion was there. I told him what happened, and he prayed to clear the space in the room. Once he was done, we went into the kitchen because I was still shaken up. Now, here's where it gets even wilder in my opinion, and I always feel like this is the part that people wouldn't believe because oftentimes think it is fake. My brother in the kitchen asks if I'd like to pray with him. Reckon I'd like to reiterate that I was already having doubts and questioning religion, and honestly, I wasn't that close with my brother, but I said okay. We bow our heads and I begin to say, dear God, please help. And then I start speaking in a different language. What? I can hear myself talking in a different language, but I know in my mind I'm speaking in English. So I stop abruptly and try again. It's like Harry Potter speaking parcel tongue. I know. This is so creepy. I do this three or four times and the same thing happens every time. I begin in English and end in a different language. Needless to say, I was very freaked out and did not have control of my mouth, but I did feel a warm sensation and peace throughout the prayer session, so I knew that whatever was happening wasn't wrong. I remember looking into the eyes of my brother when we were finished praying, and he confirmed what happened. And he was really happy about it, lol. And I was able to go to bed. Uh, That would not be the last time I had sleep paralysis, but it was certainly a memorable experience. Now, my second story. It's called Possession on the Bus. Fast forward a decade and I'm living in Chicago. To set the scene, it's a Sunday morning and I'm taking an early bus to work around 9.30 a.m. I have to admit, I was hungover. Not noticeably hungover, but the amount that you wish you had a few less drinks or didn't stay out as late as you had the night before. But still, I'm okay. Anyhow, I'm not proud of this, but I only had to make it through work for four hours on that day, so I made the excuse for the night before but was feeling the regret about it. I get on the bus, and it's pretty packed, but there was an empty seat right behind the driver, so I take it. On this bus, the seat that's behind the driver is elevated, and you don't face the front, but you face the aisle. Then the most of the other seats face the front, and there are two levels. The back of the bus is also elevated and face the driver. Most, if not all, the seats were taken, and there are also people standing in the aisle. I had my headphones in and noticed a man in the back on the first row of the elevated seats. We didn't make eye contact, but it was hard not to notice him as I was taking my seat. A few minutes go by, I have my music playing, and I could hear the man speaking loudly with anger and being disruptive. I couldn't make out what 
he was saying, one, because of my music, and two, because their words were mashed together. Imagine someone mumbling to themselves, but it's amplified in volume. So I turned my music completely down so I can hear him. He was so angry. You could feel it. But still, I was not able to make out an intelligible word. But then I got a feeling that I should pray for him. Pray for him. And I want to note, at this time, I was not religious at all, like hadn't stepped into church in years, let alone really prayed. Also, I want to note that I was not looking at him. I did not turn my head. I was looking straight ahead at the aisle in front of me and out the window. This gives me chills. So I start to pray in my head. Eyes are open looking out the window. In my mind, I say the lines of, God, please help that man in the back of the room. Please help to ease his anger. I kid you not. Out of nowhere, this man's voice goes from unintelligible to clear and perfect, and he says, Your God can't help me, you bitch. Immediately, I stopped praying in my head and thought, No, that didn't happen. And I was a little scared. So I try again. At this point, the man is back to mumbling. When I try again, at the moment I start to pray for him, remember, in her head, he says, your God can't help me, you bitch, and I know what you did last night. I immediately stop praying again. The guy goes back to mumbling, and I'm about to pee myself. So I said to myself, well, third time's a charm, so let's try this out again for confirmation. And on my third attempt to pray for him, in my mind, he says, do you really think you can help me? I know that you had six beers last night. And he starts laughing. What? I stop praying, and this man goes back to angry, loud mumbling. At that point, I knew something was seriously wrong. I could feel it. This person went from mumbling to knowing exactly what I was thinking, and they even mentioned what I was feeling guilty about. Luckily, my stop wasn't that much further from the, after this encounter, and that person never left the back of the bus or confronted me in any, any way. I also never saw them again, and I don't know what happened to them. Would love to hear your thoughts on these stories. Really appreciate you giving them a read. Thanks again and see you on the other side, Julie. I mean, what the <laughs> hell know. was that last one? Both of them. Both experiences are so dark. Yeah. Demonic. Jesus. I oh will say God. the first one, at least like when she was speaking a different language, at least it didn't feel scary. It was like a protective something warm and healing was coming into her and helping her at, mm-hmm. after the scary part, of course. Um, after the scary part. But this... And then the, she had her her brother there too for yeah. some prayer. But like this last one, I mean, yeah. no one would ever know what she's going through either because she's saying all of this in her head. Like she's it's all in her head. The confirmation. But to anyone else, they're just like, what the hell is going on in... All There's no head. indication that she's communicating telepathically with whatever this thing is. It's like it's like you're sitting there and I'm sitting like this and not even oh. Do you hurt yourself? What's going on? Oh my god, now I can't hear you. Fran? Uh oh. I can't hear you. Sabrina! What the hell? <gasps> testing, testing, testing. My audio is going. I can see it. Oh my gosh, okay, it's back. Why or wh- I shouldn't be smiling. I'm like enjoying this a little bit. That too was like much. so shocking too. And I know that these like change, like if you move certain directions, like that changes like where you're hearing it from. But oh, that like it was like a record scratch in my ear and then I couldn't hear you anymore. Okay, I'm not oh, gonna Oh god. That's weird. I know. You should still oh, be able to hear me. It's not like I need to take you know, my clothes like, off. Live. It's not like music and pausing. I'm sweating. I know. Um, it's getting hot in here. Yeah, we're covered in demons. <laughs> that's what it feels like. But that uh, that story. I mean, yeah, I love how Julie's like, oh, yeah, I want to hear y'all's thoughts. It's like my thought is that there you just came yeah. so close like face to face with a demon. You tempted a demon. I mean, I'm glad yeah. that Julie at least tried and to step in and and, help and it reminds me of in possessed, the but. story you just shared of Julia, <laughs> like how she was able to know about the cats and different things and in people's lives and like the man walking on the ocean what he was wearing and all of those things that like you 
there's no humanly right. possible way for her to know those things. Yes. And like this is very specific. Yes. I know that you had six beers last night. If you said that to me, <laughs> most nights I'd be like, that's wrong. Right. Right. Like it's so specific. Yes. And right? if it were wrong, it would be easier to like wave it off. But like this, it's three times where the first one's like, do you really think your God can help me? Like, don't pray for me. Which, okay, maybe there's other people on the bus saying a prayer. But the second she starts to do it again, he mocks her again. And the third time, it is so specific. It's almost like you're right. keeping, you keep trying, but let me tell you this. Like, let me prove to you why you can't help me. Whew. Well, the fact too that there's unintelligible mumbling uh, the whole time it. throughout these really clear sentences. It's like clearly this person is not in control at all. And only when it, this thing is trying to communicate with Julie is it becoming super clear yeah he was saying that guy was saying it out loud right like he was on the bus it just sounded like i know you had six beers last night yeah oh boy scary i hope that man was able to get help i know i'm just thinking that you and i need to do some stuff in our own spaces everyone uh, after these recordings probably cleanse. we don't normally cleanse Ooh. our space yeah which is maybe this is like the bad oh, thing oh gosh so many things are oh my maybe god we gotta do me. something i hit my microphone and then my like recording thing uh, guys i need to go i need we need to we need to go <laughs> we're on edge we're spooked Help. we gotta go <laughs> Uh, thanks for joining us. You can email us your yeah. ghost stories, your possession tales, your mm-hmm. encounters with cryptids and aliens, your loving experiences yes. with uh, people from the other yes. side. We'll November have one. Some palette cleansers <laughs> post October. So let us know. November one. Uh, you can email us that at two girls one ghost podcast. Your audio is also now delayed. Gmail.com. I can like see your mouth moving before I hear you. Ugh. technology issues well also head over to itunes rate and review us please on itunes that really does Mm -hmm. make a world of difference do that for us do that for the other podcasts you love yes uh and also join our pyramid scheme by going to two girls one ghost.com buying joining our patreon buying some cool pyramid stickers that you can slap all over the place new sweaters and telling everybody about us embroidered little ghost they're very warm Mm -hmm. yeah um the matching sweatpants Watch us on YouTube. C- come subscribe and comment on us. Comment on us. Comment on, I don't know, comment on YouTube. God, I sound like a grandma. Um, we love you all. Thank you for being here with us. We hope you're staying safe and uh, not possessed this Halloween spooky season. And check out our social media. We are doing 31 Days of Halloween and sending recommendations of our episodes, books, podcasts, movies throughout the whole month. And it's fun. Also, Yes. We're also going to be doing a costume contest yeah. and some awards. So be sure to follow us on yes. social media so that you and get And thank all you the to our editors at Fire Digital, uh, Eric Foster, Aiden Manning, Max Lodian. Thank you so much for editing our podcast. And um, <laughs> it's a thank you, but it's also a we're sorry because you don't have yes. a Possessed. choice but to potentially yes. become yes, possessed and haunted because um, you have to just send them a bunch these. of like cleansing kits, some like <laughs> crystals. Yeah. Yeah. I think so. (laughs) Anyway, thanks all for joining us and um, don't get possessed. See you. And we will on the see you on the other side.